Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Sales Development Podcast. I'm David Delaney, your host, and I'm joined here today with Dan Rude, the VP of Marketing at Lead IQ. Dan, how are you doing today? I am doing well. As we uh, said right before we got on the call, I'm dealing with uh, North Carolina pollen right now. So if I mute a few times to, to cough, um, but I'm great. Thank you. How are you? <laughs> I mean, I, I've been really looking forward to this. As I mentioned, A and sale, such a hot topic. It's probably the, the uh, subject for a lot of the podcasts that we've been doing lately. You've been knee deep in it for you know several months and years now at Lead IQ, and uh, you know helping to solve the the problems that SDRs and and AEs are facing you know, every day with their messaging and their workflow. Um, How did you get involved in this? And, you know, what, what's your take on this, this trend that we're seeing? Um, The the context for me without going through my LinkedIn bio is I I started the first part of my career in sales. So I lived in Seattle, Washington and made the rounds being an SDR and an AE for B2B SaaS companies uh, out there. And I made a transition, um, about 11 years ago into marketing leadership. And, but I've always retained this love of sales because having done it, it is a, without being a cliche, it's a really difficult and underappreciated job. And particularly the role of the SDR, it is to me the most, one, the most difficult job as a go to market function because your job is to get rejected 95 to 99 times out of a hundred. And that's a difficult thing to come into every day, ma- maintain morale. Um, yeah. So when I came into marketing, I've always had a, a special love for the people that hold the bag. Um, so coming to Lead IQ was my first time where I was able to actually um, help directly the needs of sellers. I had, a, I had a long CX background with like more customer service and customer support software. Um, but coming to Lead IQ, was amazing just because we get to have an impact on a, a, a group of people that I relate to and love uh, very much because I think the, the job's hard. It is really hard. And what if you, like when, as you're uh, analyzing the role of the SDR and you're looking at their workflow, what, what are some of the big challenges that you see? Well, I, I categorize it in two ways. One, there is the, obviously when you're a, a software company like Lead IQ, you you always evaluate the software. But the thing I'm more interested in right now is actually the the humans that are doing that job. Um, I think it's very cliche, and all of us have been to all the conferences for the last years and years where we talk about the woes of millennials and Gen Z, and it's really cliche and it gets old very quickly. But we've been doing a lot of research on who are the people coming into the role of an SDR. And it's really interesting because there are marked changes and trends that are happening that are affecting this group that that we've not seen in the history of sales. And I'll give you a couple examples. Right now, um, a person who's leaving college and coming into the SDR role um, has the least amount of work experience of any group in in recent history. So 60% of college students are going through college and matriculating without ever having a job. And a majority of high school students now are going through high school without having a job. So if you are a, a sales leader or an SDR leader, you are inheriting a group of people that you have to not only teach how to do this hard job, but you have to teach them how to work. That's interesting. You have to teach them how to work because most of them have not had a job. And so that's interesting. And then then with that, the second part that is interesting, I know it definitely relates because as we get into talking about AI and particularly generative AI and ChatGPT and what Lead IQ is doing, um, when you look at colleges right now, there is a de-emphasis on writing, which is for an SDR, one of the number one skills that you have to have. And so the average college student right now is leaving college with around 100 hours, 100 pages, I should say, of writing experience. And you can just calculate that in the hours. It's a min- minuscule amount of time that you're actually writing. And so if you look at Fortune 500 companies last year, they spent $3.1 billion in remedial writing training 
for their companies because it's it's an there's a certain epidemic about this that you're asking, especially for the sales team to be able to position, be a storyteller, know how to put words into the right order and right structure in order to compel the the listener and the reader to take action. And they're doing it with a really low amount of experience. So I don't blame Gen Z or millennials. It's not that it's more there. There's a consequence of education system. There's a policy and there's bigger things. So um, when I think about the technology, you have to have an eye for the problems that these humans, these, these ambitious relevant salespeople and SDRs coming in, what they what they're dealing with. And it's it's unique in in the last 30, 40 years. And so anyway, I, I well, we're very passionate about that. And and you know, uh I'm just thinking of my generation, which is before Gen Z. We we all um a lot of people had jobs in in high school and, and college. And it seems I don't know what the stat was, you know, in previous generations, but it seems like 60% is is really high. Uh, why why do you think that uh you know people uh, you know don't don't get that work experience? I I don't in the research that we've been doing I don't I don't have a good reason why other than overall economic conditions of this generation is where it's the richest generation that we've had almost in history. Mm. And so I don't, I don't know if it's a monetary thing where there's not the, as much pressure on, on, on the demographics of people who are, who are able to get to college going through, but um, it's interesting. It's, it's very anecdotal, but I've got four kids. I've got now three, as of yesterday, three kids in high school. And my oldest mm. just got his first job. He's 17 and he got a job and I got the great opportunity to coach him through writing a, a cover letter and and a you know a little bit of a resume. But it was interesting to me because when when I was telling him, okay, you need to send an email. He his first question was, do I put a sentence in the subject line? Mm. And I was like, what? And I was realizing like he's an educated kid; he gets good grades, but in school he's working on an iPad. He doesn't know how to type because they're not being taught that. And he's not being taught any basic like communication skills as a 17 year old. And for me as a parent, I was like, well, okay, that, well, that's my job then to help him get a job, get labor experience. Like yesterday was his first day where he, he worked seven hours because they're on a track out right now. So he was like stressed about it. So there's a character building. There's like all of these elements, but then you just see how it's playing out from even not to harp on the education system, but they're not being taught these certain skills that when you get out of high school, get out of college and go in to the workforce, there's certain things that you and I, of course, are used to because of the way that we, because we are older, uh, more seasoned, um, that we we just had a different matricular experience than than I think my kids are having and oh, your kids are probably having. Those, yeah, those practical skills that you 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 can't assume the educational system is necessarily doing. And now what you're saying is they go all the way through college and now they're on your SDR team. And yep. <laughs> it's like, you, you think that you can do some training on Salesforce and, you know, the playbook and lead IQ, but it's actually, you know, even taking a step back from there. Um, yeah. And on the writing, um, the writing is really hard, and especially with the distractions that we have. And so you're saying that they they don't get much experience in taking all these ideas and hammering it into something, you know, impactful. Um, and you you see that happening in the in the workforce now as well. Yeah, I, I think now I have a little bit of a bias because I've been in marketing for some time, and when we we see this on the marketing side. And certainly on the sales side, <clears throat> that because the bias for particularly software companies um, has been toward technology as the thing that fixes everything, and so if you yeah. and you see this in marketing, so it's about marketing automation and it's about attribution scoring, and there's much less emphasis on the words, and that's interesting to me. And I do have a bias because I was an acting major in college, which. I didn't think was probably well suited to coming into software, but it's actually been really good in some ways because when yeah. you come from a background where you need to know what a plot is, you need to know that who the hero in a story is, who the villain is in a story, who the guide is, who's the 
Obi-Wan Kenobi that comes along to help the hero accomplish their journey. That's just one of a thousand methodologies of going, I need to know when I'm writing what is going to arrest the attention of a of a listener or a, a reader. So for you, I'll put you on the spot. What's the what's the what's the latest best movie you've seen? Latest best movie. Um I Wakanda Forever. Okay. So when you're watching that movie, do you do you recall daydreaming during that? Or were you invested in that story? Um invested. Yeah. If you look at, um, not to be overly throwing out statistics, 30% of the human brain's day, our waking hours, 30% of our time is spent daydreaming. And so the only time that we don't daydream is when we're engaged in a good story, whether it's reading or watching a movie or at a play, because the story structure, the mathematics of the story structure does the daydreaming for us. And so those, not to go down a rabbit hole, but that's interesting because if you're using generative AI, or if you're just writing an outbound message or doing a presentation, if you're not looking and trying to self-educate in what is the order in which something unfolds that arrests the attention of your audience, um, that's a problem. And, and I think a lot of, and I see this in marketing too, and I see it in sales. If I ask a salesperson, you know, you build a presentation, that's awesome. What was the... What was your thinking in how you ordered the events that you do in that presentation? Most salespeople don't know. It's more just intuitive or they have a natural gift for it or they just take a template. Um, but the, the whole idea of language and, and writing and knowing the order of things. Um, and now that we're getting into chat GPT and generative AI, now you have the potential to help educate sellers. And it also has the potential to hurt sellers. Because then they're thinking, I don't have to know any of this because I can just rely on a robot to do it and pray and have faith that the robot knows what to do. And I don't think that's, it's certainly not the case today. Mm -hmm. And so, and and that's, uh, if you look at your inbox, a lot of the messaging that comes out, it's it's not necessarily a story um, or or a transformation. It's, it's more just a, a list of, features for example and it's it, you can kind of tell when when you're being prospected to and it's it's uh generated from like a sequence you know right. at this point you kind of know okay this is number one two three four especially if you're in the tech industry it's like okay i'm starting in somebody's sequence <laughs> now um and and then then you throw in ai on top of that to someone who is just coming into the workforce and um, hasn't spent a lot of time writing. Um, you could see how it could go in a lot of different directions. Um, so, hundred percent, and then the, yeah. and even even bigger for a brand. Um, again, you're. I go back to again the SDR job to me is the hardest. It's certainly the hardest job in sales, and part of that is. But from a if you're the CMO or the CRO or the CEO of a company you are relying on a 24, 25 year old to represent your brand with quality and consistency. So it's not just about the SDR. It's about, it's about, can you create pipeline? And to create pipeline, you have to be able to represent with consistency, the brand values and, and what is the problem that we're solving? And can I order my language in a way that will generate interest? And so it has massive repercussions, not for the SDR manager, but for the Overall pipeline, the the companies right now, especially in today in in April twenty twenty three, um, the the SDR leaders that are maintaining their roles and the VPs of sales that are maintaining their roles is is right now very largely on can you make outbound work, and if you can make outbound work today, you are a gem because it's difficult because we all know budgets are contracting. There's a lot of layoffs going on in software. And so the companies that are able to have a consistent pattern of pipeline creation is your, your gold if you're able to do that. And all of these things that we're talking about are contributing uh, to that. It's funny because uh, I, I just, uh, on a personal note, I've gotten like two inbound leads in like three months and they were both people trying to embed um links into our blog <laughs> so <laughs> they went on to the inbound form 
Phil, and I got all excited because I finally got an inbound lead. And it was like, hey, can I put a link into your blog? So right, right. whoever did that, that's the worst possible prospecting right. methodology. Right. Never go into somebody, especially a small business. Don't go into somebody's right. contact form and pretend. But the point I'm trying to make is you got to nail outbound right now. Yeah. If you're in the tech industry, for sure, because yeah. the inbound leads have like trickled to a, a standstill. Totally. Yeah, and, and and if we think about it, and and hopefully this is hopefully this is helpful. When we think about the a part of the formula, there's certainly there's a whole other podcast just about the storytelling part of it because that's really interesting, and there's a lot of ways to do that. Yeah. But if you're looking at the basics of an out of what the SDR is having to deal with today, you are having to do the research in order to create personalization. You have to be able to effectively convey your company's value proposition. And then third, you have to be able to transition between those two things. And that's interesting. So you have the storytelling part, which is your value prop. But then you have that that part that is so hard, which is you said it, we talk about sequences. We're talking about leaning towards spam a little bit, right? Or very much spam. And then you have hyper-personalization. So I'll give you an example. One of our uh, lead IQ customers. I was talking. I interviewed one of the um, uh, main SDRs on that on that team for a, a, a webinar that we did last month. And this is an SDR who's using Lead IQ's generative AI tool called Scribe, um, and he is generating seventy and sending seventy messages a day, and using Lead IQ. And that's cool. Like we like to see that because that's a power user, and he's using it effectively. But if you look at that before. He's using Lead IQ. He's having to read 10Ks, do research on the prospect personally and the company professionally, looking at news. And so, what we're asking our SDRs to do is to do more outbound while we know if they don't do the research and they don't personalize it, they don't have a value prop, and then they don't have a good transition to go from personalization to in, to the with the insights to the value prop, it's it's not going to be red. So we're putting a lot of pressure on those teams. And that's where we see a lot of promise with generative AI to help. And particularly what Lead IQ is doing, because we took a specific take on this a year ago as we started building, because we were really lucky to get into the ChatGPT um, b- ecosystem and the, the building community. And then we're able to, to make it our own um, and so it's a fun problem to hit because we're trying to help people get to speed in terms of outbound, but also retain and hopefully improve overall quality of, of those outbound messages that you're sending. Yeah. So so what you're saying is we, we need more outbound and and it's it's almost like antibiotic resistance. Like like we need to keep throwing more, more, you know, um messages out there but at the same time if it's there's this explosion of spam and and um if we don't personalize and have research and make it relevant to the pain points then it's it's not going to go anywhere right. and so but at the same time we're asking th- these these people to be able to do this and you could spend the whole day um researching 10ks and pulling out pain points and finding all this personalization but then you only spend you only send one email a day, and, right. you know. Um, so th- 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 what you're saying is we can use AI to to accelerate the research process to make uh, you know personalized messages and 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 send out enough of those to be able to get some sort of reaction. Right. So it's like this is where I'm going to reveal that I'm a marketer. Um, okay in a corny way, but we're asking our, our salespeople to be Sherlock and Shakespeare. We're, <laughs> we're asking you to be able to, you said it really well. You're asking them to be able to research like in a private investigator. And then we're asking you to be really good at writing. Right. And obviously there's other, and that's on top of the fact that they most salespeople are kind of in process hell where they're using seven to 10 tools having to synchronize data. There's a lot of other distractions that they're dealing with. So yeah, AI has the means to help while retaining the agency of the seller. Because you that's our big thing. You've got to retain the agency of the seller. 
that that they are the ones who are hitting send, right? They are the ones who need to know if that's a quality message, a quality insight, a quality transition, but you can use AI to accelerate that massively. So, and not to do a product pitch because and I'll, I'll tell everyone at the end where to go if they want to try this out. Um, but for us, the, the thing that we did that I think was very unique when it came to generative AI was we were able to retain and get a patent around the aspect of the insights and research. That's where we took a turn that no one else is, is doing right now. We were first to that, which we're very proud of, of course. But what it did is it allows us to offer the SDR when they're when they find that contact through Lead IQ's data and workflow platform, and then they want to send that message and integrate it to Salesloft and Outreach and Gmail if you're using that, um, all the workflow stuff that Lead IQ has been known for for a long time. Um, what we did was was really focus in on how do we generate insights fast, right? So there's two aspects again: insights. So we're able to if you're going after publicly traded companies, we can read the company's 10K in about two seconds and offer you insights based on that and your company's value prop to be able to help generate that message. So we're able to look at everything from Twitter feeds to in the news to LinkedIn profiles of the people that you're prospecting, the company, all these different insights we can pull in seconds and then offer uh, what we do today is offer three email options, right? Some are a little longer, some are a little shorter, and they've all got insights that you're selecting, what do, what do you want to do? Do you want to read their 10K and have something personal about them? Um, and then you can choose your company's value prop. You can have multiple value props based on ICP. I can go, here's my value prop for a RevOps leader. Here's a, and this is for us, right? Here's a value prop if I'm going after the VP of sales because we're selling into those crews. Um, and then it generates those messages in seconds, but again, retains the agency, the seller to be able to look at the message, choose the right one, and then as we're advancing, providing analytics to show you performance data on, on where are you seeing clicks and where are you seeing replies so that we can get better and better at, at using our AI models to get better and better based on performing emails, right? So we're very excited about that because we think what it solves for the customer, in our case, the SDR and the AE, is the ability to drastically reduce the amount of research time, like you said, that you can have a um a Connor who's an SDR power user for Lead IQ who's sending 70 or 75 messages a day while still retaining personalization, having good insights mixed with good value props and good transitions. So um I think I did a product pitch, so I apologize, but it's 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 good because there is a lot of pressure that's going to the SDR community right now to it to really has. And so when you say human agency, tell me about that. That so so <laughs> I, I picture um Jarvis, right? In the the right. um, yeah, the, so there's there's Iron Man's in the suit, but Jarvis yes. is is the so he still has human agency, right? But, but Jarvis is doing all these things that he could never do. Correct. I mean, the fear for all of us with generative AI, there's a couple that are marked, just really apparent right now. One is in truth telling, and this is this goes beyond sales people. Sales. This is just generative AI in, in particular. Generative AI, particularly ChatGPT, um, is really good at syntax. It's really good at syntax. It, but what it also is really bad at is you not knowing whether what it just said beautifully is actually true. And you saw this when Google launched their version. I, I'm totally blanking on the name of it, on their version of, of generative AI to compete against ChatGPT. When they did their launch, they did the poor product marketer who did the demo. In the demo, the generative AI produced content that was inaccurate. And Google's valuation went down $100 billion in one day because people are looking at it and going, hold on. Well, ChatGPT is dealing with the same problem where you have inaccuracies um, said with amazing confidence. Right? Yeah. It's beautifully written misstatements, right? So when we looked at this in terms of, to your point about being... Jarvis in the Iron Man suit, one of the things we had to do from a tech standpoint is bring in the beauty of a chat GPT platform, but arrest its um, ability to be inaccurate. So that's where we focus on. It's not just about the SDR. It's about the marketing organization going, what is your company's value props that you're teaching your SDRs and your AEs? Well, we can easily plug those in so that the, the, the content that we're producing 
is accurate all the time because we're not making things up because we're basing it on your value proposition and then looking at new ways to massage that to make that that clear and true. Um, but at the end of the day, we're still telling salespeople, look, if you have a message that you're trying to get it to 150 words and we produced one that was 180 words, it takes you 20 seconds to edit a message. It's not hard. Once the research is done for you, the, the value prop is done for you. You have a complete message in front of you. You you should take a second <laughs> to look at that message and evaluate whether there's a change here or a change there that you want to make. And so it does create a lot of efficiency and consistent quality from a brand standpoint, um, while still making sure the salesperson is hitting send, that the salesperson is responsible for the content that's being produced and not just going, you know, click, generate message, send. And, and but of course, that comes with training. And, and accountability within organizations, because of course, like any abuse, you're going to have people that just, you know, click and send. That's, that's totally true with any technology that, that you have. Sure. And um, so in writing the value prop at the beginning, so there's, there, is that usually handled by the marketing team or, or did, does the SDR come into that so, so the value prop is actually embedded in the system, and Correct. and so that that's approved by the marketing team. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So there's a couple, and this is fun. It's it's an interesting question because it is the most surprising part of when we launched Scribe. Um, the most surprising part with me was some of the customers' confusion about the value prop because. And that's my own bias because I'm in marketing. So it's like, yeah, value props, elevator pitches, like what's your sales messaging? And what we found were it was intimidating to, to like, especially if an SDR manager was in charge. What we found is that to answer your question is, is that I think the best practice for it is a partnership with your marketing organization and certainly your overall sales enablement organization, that if you are training SDRs, you are, of course, training them with value propositions. So for us, it, it's not a, a thesis, a, like a, a you know a long term paper that we're writing. This is literally a message of your value prop in you know under 600, 500 characters. So it's not it's more of an elevator pitch of what your of what your company does. And so then what you can do is in Lead IQ, you can have multiple value props. So take us as an example. We sell into sales organizations. So our SDRs and our AEs have a a, uh, um, a a a content library essentially of value props for you know VP of RevOps, you know sales enablement leaders, SDR managers, VPs of sales, you know uh, marketing operations, whatever it is. So that and then you can also be topical, right? You can say, hey, I want to I want to attack efficiency on this one. I want to attack you know, and so you can build that library easily and over time, and then based on performance. You can then make adjustment. And then what's cool is that the AI model is observing and contributing to how can we position that value prop um, uh, better and better and better over time. Um, so yeah, the value prop, I, we probably should use a different word for it, like elevator pitch, because it's not like a six-page document that you know that the, that you need input. It's really what's the core essence of the problem that you solve for the seller. And then how do we plug that in? And, and how do we have multiple versions of that based on the need of that persona that you're that you're going after? And that should be something that the SDR is already being trained on. So it's not the companies that are successful with it already have value props, it already have personas, and already have not an ICP. And so it's really just plugging into the information that's typically already within a company and just simply pasting it into scribe and massaging that and then. Um, it from there, you're just continuing to just use the same value proposition over and over again versus chat GPT. Let's say I'm having to give it a value prop every time and then having to receive a message that I have to edit for both uh, um, length typically and then have to uh, edit for uh, truthfulness, which was the most surprising thing for us as we were thinking about it is really when you're promising things to customers that aren't true. That kills your brand, of course, because you can't mm -hmm. you can't pay off what you're saying that we do, and so we really try to arrest the AI to not do that, right? And that's what makes it from a lead IQ perspective. It's what makes it pretty magical 
um, and how we're generating messages for for sales organizations. It's interesting because if they don't if they don't have the elevator pitch on hand uh, or the value prop, then they probably yeah. have deeper problems. That you I don't. Gotta... I didn't want to say. I didn't want to say it. But no it offense. Was, it, it, no offense. But it was. Yeah. It was. It was an issue um, that we do see from time to time where the leaders are going. Uh, what's the value proposition? And I'm going. Uh-oh. Isn't that the fir- that's the first thing? So I don't think it's a I don't think it's a, a systemic problem, but it is one that yeah. was a surprise of going. I don't know our company's value problem. Like, oh, okay, that's a there's some sales enablement that needs to uh, to take place. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> maybe that's the core problem. It's probably like, well, I I know I know the elevator pitch, but I don't necessarily call right. it a value prop. That's correct. Like, and, correct. Some but, of it is. But there language. is that that upfront. Um, and it'd be interesting just from a product perspective, you could anonymize and share value props with all your customers, um, and, you know, and, and, and then it's like, you don't even have to think about anything, just buy it and yep. press a button and you're good to go. And we've started to do that actually in the last three months, we've actually been blogging more on giving even down to Mad Lib form of going yeah. like, here's the essentials. And I do think it's useful because if you are, yeah. you know, especially if you are, um, you know, I'll make a, a plug for it. If you go to leadiq.com forward slash scribe, you can sign up for a freemium version of just our generative AI platform scribe. And so for like individual users who are going in, tools like that to go, hey, what are the three easy elements that I could take my company's elevator pitch or value prop and put it into a concise uh, form that you can then just easily plug in? Because we do have individual users um, that are, are doing that. Now, certainly when we're implementing company-wide, that's more of an implementation service from us to go, okay, here's best practices for, and a guide for like, here's what you might want in your value prop for a company. Um, so yeah, there is, I was saying this to somebody the other day, it's interesting. And I was this way, certainly as a seller, it, you know, we have, the lead IQ has been a data company for a long time. And what, what you see is that it's becoming harder and harder and harder to um, always have accurate data. Everyone's dealing with it because privacy laws and, you know, GDPR, like it's a hard business for everybody who's in the data community. And what you find with sellers sometimes is that you're hoping that it's right 100% of the time and it's not, right? It never is and it won't and it will not ever be. And it's the same true for generative AI. Like it's, it is, there is labor that you have to put into it to, to again, be the human and look at this and going, is this the right value prop? Is it generating the right type of message? So there is some work to be done that to us is not very difficult. And I think we've made it very easy. Um, but to say it's a magic bullet to go, we're just going to find, scour the world, bring it in, and you have to do no labor. That's not true at all. We're just significantly decreasing the labor while while increasing the consistency and quality uh, for these people that are having to hit send, send, send. Uh, we want to help them be better and, and be faster at it. That's amazing. It's a great opportunity. And um, it's funny, just circling back to the first part of the conversation. It's like, um, do, do, like we're we're not we're not taught how to work anymore, and um, we don't have to really know how to write. And maybe that's okay, you know. At some point right. in five years, it's really not going to matter. But at this point, it still does, and um, you you have to bring those skills to the table, even with tools like this. Yeah, it's the thinking part that even if if I'm you know, thinking about marketing content, like I need to have, I need to have some sort of principle set that I use, you know, like for me, I grew up in more of a, a challenger sale training environment. So that's always been a tool of like, what is the warmer? What's the reframe? How do I use data and emotional impact? That's a story form, right? Or if I'm using, I'm a big fan of a company called Story Brand that uses literally um, script writing techniques and has commercialized it to business. Like, and they have a formula so I always encourage people, like technology aside, you need to have a methodology or, or a set of methodologies that you can draw on to go, is this the right message? Because you know, generative AI is not producing your constant interactions with customers. Like for us right now, we're helping you get in the door. But after that, you still have to write, right? You still have to produce content. And so, you know, just for what it's worth as a, you know, a, a middle-aged former sales and now marketing leader. Like it's it's a good skill for those individual contributors that are wanting to be better. Find methodologies to help you judge 
whether what you're doing is has a has a um, it's not just a, an art. It, it is very much a science, and there's a form. There's formulas that are more effective than others, and that's as easy as a Google search and watching YouTube videos on 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 how to perform better as a writer. So um, I'm very passionate about the writing. Not even being the, the most amazing writer myself, I, I enjoy it though. I love it, and I've got two pieces of homework for people that we actually had Dan on a um, a conference uh, video on our YouTube channel where you go through your story process and uh, it's on the 10 bound YouTube channel. So I'll put a link in there. That should actually be required listening. Before yeah, that's a really good, it is, I'm, <laughs> I, it's a, I, I'm going through a particular methodology, but it's a good, it is a great precursor just to think about the order in which I'm saying the things I'm saying, you can do it in a way that's superior in terms of, again, I keep saying arresting the attention of the audience. That, that's all of our goal. All of our goal in sales, I've always said this, is to persuade. That's what it is. I'm trying to persuade you to take the meeting, persuade you to look at my product, see a demo, you know, engage to buy. It's just that everything we're doing is persuasion. And there are real and timeless methodologies that have been built upon over time to help all of us do that better. And we're all on this journey. You know, it's always changing. Um, but yeah, I would encourage the audience like, you know, that that talk I did is a good one. And there's a lot of others that you can learn to be a better communicator. And it's 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 more difficult today than it was with the remote and distributed workforces, less water cooler. You're not hearing as much many times from other professionals who are ahead of you in the game. And so there is a little bit of labor that goes into uh, having to kind of self-teach, um, yeah. which I empathize with very much. That's that's a that's a new a newer problem. For, for SDRs. Yeah. You know, you've got the whole world at your fingertips with YouTube, but it's just, it's, it, you lose that, that fun and camaraderie and like the human element. So it's yes. great in, in the, you can access all this information and, and get like a mentor. Basically you could, yeah. Dan could be your mentor right now through hours of podcasts and, and webinars that you've done. Um, but, you know, just, uh, we we do lose that human <laughs> connection, which is, sure. which is okay. You know, we got to find it in different ways. Um, the the other quick thing I wanted to mention, everybody, is um, you mentioned Story Brand. Um, the, I think the guy's name is Donald Miller. Yeah, who wrote that book? That's yeah. highly recommended um, for for focusing on on this topic. Um, this is a great uh, you know the way that he goes through that that methodology. I was lucky enough to get certified. I got to work with Don three times. Oh, and wow. um, it's a great, I think for an entry level, especially if you're looking for an easy methodology, that's quite effective. It's a good, it's a definitely story brands are great, a, a great, a great place to go. Read that, study it, listen to Dan's talk, and then go to two, two links in the show notes. We're going to have leadiq.com, request a demo, and then forward slash scribe where people can get a free uh you know, version of a lightweight version of what we've been talking about. Yeah. I mean, I think if I gave the 30 second pitch on lead IQ, a lot of what we're trying to do is, is help with tool consolidation to help you not only find and capture the right contact in a workflow that's smoother, but then also being able to target key accounts and contacts based on job changes and sales triggers. And then that final step, of course, is what we've been talking about today is the, is the message generation and so to have a, but we're really working hard to consolidate and help people have a single experience to, to make outbound work, right? To generate pipeline through outbound prospecting. So yeah, I'd encourage you to leadiq.com, talk to sales, request a demo, or if you just want to try out Scribe, uh, we have premium version of our entire platform on leadiq.com. And then we have um, just the Scribe standalone for those who just want to mess around with the generative AI component of it. Um, but yeah, we'd love to, we'd love to talk to you if uh if you have interest in, and in certainly, um, um, if you if you want to talk to me personally, it's dan.rude at leadiq.com. You can reach out to me, and I'm happy to. I, I can nerd out on the story part of this all day. It's a lot of fun to talk about. I love it, and and so what you know your your vision is that they can stay in Lead IQ all day. It's like one pane of glass um, because that's that's another thing. As you mentioned, if you've got seven to ten tools that you're trying to toggle back yeah. and forth in all day, it gets a little crazy. Yeah. And, and our, our model really is, we think the formula for outbound prospecting is obviously you have to find the right contact. You need to know when to reach out to them. 
And then you know what you need to know what to say. And, and those are the three main elements. And so, and then obviously, and we have solutions for this around data synchronization, because that's another big problem is keeping, you know, HubSpot and Salesforce and SalesLoft and Outreach all synchronized. And data quality is, of course, always a big issue. And that's kind of our roots. And so we're very proud of that aspect of it. But yeah, I mean, trying to, it's really, it's, it's not even about killing your competition. It's really about what, how can we keep sellers in more of a single point of glass to be efficient and more effective in their overall outbound prospecting journey. And the messaging is just one, one part of that, but the data and workflow and knowing when, you know, to reach out to somebody based on an advocate that changed jobs and now you should go after them at their new company. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot there that we're very, very proud to offer. I love it. I love it. And I'm, I'm a user. I, I love it. Um, and you know, at, like I said, since the inbound leads are not coming, I'm in there all day. And actually I, I have a, the, it pops out of the side of my Chrome browser, but I, I, I need to dive in and, and use scribe as well. So, um, Dan, I appreciate you coming on and sharing yeah. your wisdom. We'll get you on again. Thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks to the audience for listening. Um, we're very proud to be partnering with 10 So, so thanks so much.